Well, here's another nice kettle of fish you pickled me in. Hello, hello, and welcome once more to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast, where chivalry is our middle name, to say nothing of the hospitality. Disappointingly for you, I'm still Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, and you're listening to episode 15, where today's film in focus is the wonderful silent short, The Finishing Touch. Later in the show, and to help us to discuss the film and much more besides, we are blessed to be joined by not one, but two special guests. First, we'll be zooming over to California to meet up with Laurel and Hardy expert, author and friend of the show, Randy Scretvet. And then from California, we'll be heading northeast and dropping into Ontario, Canada, where we'll be welcoming a brand new guest to the show, author of The Art of Laurel and Hardy, Kip Harness. So stay tuned, there's a lot to look forward to. Isn't that a daisy? It's all right with me. Hello? Hello. My name is Bob Writing, and I'm a longtime Laurel and Hardy fan, period. I started collecting Super 8 Laurel and Hardy movies in the early 70s and have quite a collection. And now that, of course, has um, moved into DVDs and CDs and records and all that. I just found your blogcast and started listening to the first um, episode and I'm going to go through all 16 episodes. And at the same time, I've been purchasing the Lost Films of Laurel and Hardy so I can follow as you go. So very excited about this. Um, good job. Uh, very professional. Very enjoyable. Thanks a lot. Who was it? Oh, some fella having a joke. Thanks for your lovely comments, Bob. It's great to hear from you, and I'm so glad you discovered the show. I'm especially pleased that you're watching the films along with each episode too, as that is one of my objectives, is to get more people watching and re-watching the boys' films and then joining in the discussions about each one, perhaps in the Blogheads Facebook group or in whatever Laurel and Hardy groups you may be part of. Um, I also want to say uh, hello to Gravity Amplifiers, who is one of our loyal followers over on Instagram, and to say a huge thank you for this incredible review of the podcast he left recently. I promise I didn't write this myself. Uh, he writes, Laurel and Hardy Blogcast is incredible. I am 43, been a fan of this team since I was a single digit age. I absolutely know that Stan Laurel is a genius and so important for all of our laughing fodder that we enjoy today. He was the foundation builder. Oliver Hardy was also a comic and performing genius. This podcast is one of the great in-depth looks at these two gentlemen's professional lives, and I applaud him for the guests that he has on, and also for the amount of time and passion used propelling this series forward. If you are even a casual fan, or have any interest in these two comic legends, I seriously beg you to tune in. Listening to this, you can learn a lot about the craft. It's also outstanding how young the creator of this podcast is. I don't know about that. Uh, we are both on Team Youngster. That in itself is pretty remarkable. Spread the word that this podcast exists and let's all enjoy the ride. This is one of the greatest detailed histories of Laurel and Hardy in the modern era and the discussions on this podcast are entertaining. Masterfully edited, the sound bites chosen for the perfect moment are a nice touch. Bravo and many more episodes to come and we haven't even gotten to the talkies yet. Pay this podcast forward. Uh, thank you so much for that review. I can't tell you how encouraging and inspiring I find messages like this, so please do keep them coming. Um, and so, without any more idle faldadash, let's begin our look at the next film in the Laurel and Hardy canon. The Finishing Touch was filmed December 2nd to December 17th, 1927. It was released February 25th, 1928. It was a two-reeler produced by Hal Roach, directed by Clyde Brookman, supervised by Leo McCary, photographed by George Stevens. Leave Em Laughing was an important juncture in the development of Laurel and Hardy. Each classic film starting with the second hundred years and leading up to Leave Em Laughing, all undoubtedly brilliant in their own way, had in effect been the boys' training ground. Although likely not planned in this way, these films had acted as test opportunities for them to really get to know one another, to work out how the characters would relate to each other, discover traits and mannerisms that they could turn into trademarks, and that their partner could learn how to react to and build upon. It's remarkable and quite unique to be able to witness the birth and development of a legendary team, film by film, 
In the second hundred years, the boys discovered their bond, their indestructible unity, two friends closer than brothers together against the world. In Hats Off, as well as the immortal derbies and shabby suits, their undaunted tenacity, their intent to succeed against insurmountable odds is introduced. In Putting Pants on Philip, their unmistakable chemistry is evident, along with the relationship dynamic of Hardy being in charge, assuming an almost fatherly role as Stan's protector in this wide and dangerous world. Then, finally, in the Battle of the Century, we are introduced to Laurel and Hardy as the Masters of Disaster, the Chaos Makers. We witness the ease and speed with which their personal squabbles and altercations can be shared with anyone within a pie-throwing radius. How a once peaceful scene can become widespread carnage in moments, at which point our accidental anarchists slip away into the sunset, leaving a trail of often unintentional destruction behind them. Leave Em Laughing was then the first film that brought all of those ingredients together. Admittedly, the team's growth and development didn't end at this point. On the contrary, they would continue to evolve as each film went by. But evident here was the true concentrated formula that the world recognises now as Laurel and Hardy. This organic creation set the mould or template for their films and for their partnership that would last the rest of their careers. All the studio had to worry about now was to find stories, plots and situations in which to place this new team. Almost as soon as filming wrapped on Leave Em Laughing, Stan and the writers began work on the boys' next picture, The Finishing Touch. The origin of the story is a little unclear, with a number of reputable authors and experts stating the film is a simple remake of earlier solo films, with titles suggested ranging from Stan's The Egg, Smithy or The Noon Whistle, and even Hardy's Stick Around. Whilst it's undoubtedly true that a number of gags were reused from all of these films, calling the finishing touch a remake of any of them is arguably a stretch too far. Possibly the most reliable claim was made by the boy's official biographer, John McCabe, who, writing in his seminal work on the team, Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy, stated, quote, Sometimes the idea for a film would come from an object. One gag man happened to be passing a partially constructed house on his way to work. He brought a few thoughts to the gag session, and a general working script was fashioned out of the discussion that followed. One can easily see the similarities between the finishing touch and the aforementioned solo films, especially as notable gags were indeed lifted from each one and reused to great effect here. For instance, the gag of someone swallowing mouthfuls of nails was originally used in The Egg, 1922, and again in Smithy, 1924. In the team's later reworking, it's Ollie who not once but three times thinks it's a good idea to carry handfuls of nails in his mouth, only to accidentally, but inevitably, swallow them every time. Another prominent gag reused is when Stan carries the longest plank anyone has ever seen from both ends at the same time. He walks in and out of shot, left to right, carrying the first end of the plank past befuddled cop Edgar Kennedy, we and Edgar see the middle part of the plank keeping on coming past longer and longer until eventually Stan reappears carrying the other end of the plank. It was Stan himself who performed this brilliant gag originally in The Noon Whistle, 1923, and again for a third and final time in what is perhaps one of the few highlights of their first film for 20th Century Fox, 1941's Great Guns. This version is perhaps more elaborate as it happens not once but three times, and each time it's slightly different. Evidence, perhaps, that Stan actually did have some creative input into this later project. The rule of three is something that Charles Barr talks expertly about in his simply titled book Laurel and Hardy. Barr identified the triple gag structure as an intentional strategy that got more laughs. To clarify his point, Barr lists examples of this structure all from the finishing touch. Number one, Ollie tries three times to carry a door frame up a ramp and onto the porch of the house. Number two, Ollie swallows a mouthful of nails three times. Number three, three humiliations for the nurse, Dorothy Coburn. And number four, three humiliations for the cop, Edgar Kennedy. The finishing touch is the first picture that places the boys simply as labourers. There's no fancy plot, just a job to do. As professional finishers, they've been employed by the hopeful homeowner, Sam Lofkin, to complete the construction of his new house, and he promises to pay them $500 if they finish the job by noon next Monday. 
Ever the optimist, Ollie declares that for $500, they would finish by noon that same day. The finishing touch paved the way for many of the best Laurel and Hardy pictures in the boys' canon, namely The Music Box, Busy Bodies and Toad in a Hole. It's in this environment where the team excels, Stan and Ollie at their best with a job to do. They have no need for complex plots or elaborate dialogue. This kind of pantomime slapstick is what Stan and Babe were great at. It's the reason that the Music Box won an Academy Award and why Toad in a Hole is so loved by fans across the world. They are such simple ideas. Set the boys a task and watch them make a complete hash of it. What makes Laurel and Hardy films so special, what provides that unique magic, is the way that Stan and Ollie relate and react to one another, whether fighting or in moments of tender togetherness. It is their interaction that provides the alchemy. Practical situations such as building a house, fixing up a boat, or carrying a large heavy object up a flight of steps give them the ideal opportunity to play off each other. To see Ollie, nearly always the recipient of the greatest misfortune, growing more and more frustrated and annoyed as Stan's incompetence winds him up tighter and tighter, which then causes him to be on the wrong end of even more misfortune, is a sheer delight. Once again, Charles Barr summarises this beautifully. Quote, The characters are expressed in action with a beautiful directness. Stan is dumb. Ollie impatient. All the subtle variations of their relationship, and there are many, are based on this distinction, which doesn't change. Every small-scale catastrophe in the finishing touch comes from some combination of dumbness and ill-judged violence. At the end, with perfect symmetry, violence, throwing stones, leads on to stupidity, picking up the breakstone, to destruction. Then, back to its origin in individual stupidity. Stan and violence, Ollie. The cycle might go on indefinitely. Stan and the gag men must have put in overtime on this picture, as it is littered with gags. They're often not large and elaborate, but they're all quality. From the first scene where Stan hops out of the truck, one can't help but smile, and from there, the laughs just keep on coming. The picture was filmed completely on location in the Cheviot Hills district of Los Angeles, an area the studio would use again on future classics such as Big Business and Bacon Grabbers. As Randy Scrapbed informs us, the half-finished house that the boys are tasked with completing was purpose-built by the Roach construction team on a vacant lot, which gives the film a very airy, natural look and feel. Stan and Ollie's building is located directly next door to a sanitarium. A no-nonsense nurse, played brilliantly by Dorothy Coburn, demands absolute quiet, and she sends across street cop Edgar Kennedy in only his second picture with the boys to enforce her wishes with the boisterous builders. With a delicious smirk, Kennedy struts across and delivers the line, If you must make a noise, make it quietly. A line that would reappear in later Laurel and Hardy films and be often quoted by fans. As a result, Stan and Ollie solemnly agree and begin to tiptoe around the construction site, attempting to construct a house without making a sound. Ridiculously farcical and brilliantly funny. All the players are at their best in this film, and if you're looking for an introduction to Laurel and Hardy's silent comedies, you could do a lot worse than starting with this one. Over the years, the finishing touch has been a touch overlooked and hasn't received the praise that I believe it rightfully deserves. Notable commentator William K. Everson called it a slight disappointment and somewhat mechanical. And even Randy Scrapvet could only describe it as a pleasant enough little picture and further that it isn't as memorable as the films which preceded it. In fairness, Stan Laurel possibly set the trend for this as he himself, replying in a letter to a friend in April 1928, wrote of his and Babe's dissatisfaction with the picture. Quote, Glad you liked the finishing touch. We were kind of disappointed with it here. Felt that it wasn't up to our standard. Maybe it's good that we feel that way sometimes. Makes us try to do better. Of course, we can't expect to do knockouts every time, especially as we make picture in eight to ten days, and ideas for material don't come easy. So we must consider ourselves pretty lucky up to now. The fact that they were disappointed in the finishing touch is in itself remarkable but it certainly confirms that by the sixth film into their official partnership, Stan and Babe and the team at the Roach Studio had already set the bar very high indeed. As was becoming the norm, however, the movie-going public and critics lapped it up as the following reviews testify. From the Motion Picture News, April 7th, 1928. 
Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy are a couple of dumb contractors in this very funny Roach 2 reeler. It is chock full of funny situations and gags, and is good enough for a laugh a minute. Some of it, of course, is very silly, but so much of it is good that an audience will laugh at even the silliest incidents. From the Screenland Theatre Nevada, Ohio, and featured in Exhibitors Herald, a moving picture world, November 2nd, 1928. Hooray, cheers and thanksgiving! A number one comedy by gum. Lots of good clean fun for our lovely patrons. Give us more like this. Again from Exhibitors Herald, a moving picture world, November 2nd, 1928. This one's from the Central Theatre in Selkirk, Manitoba. Same old news. This pair don't make them poor. And then from the film Daily, April the 1st, 1928. In Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, MGM has a comedy team that is immense. Of course, they have been provided with a laugh number that gives them a chance to get somewhere with their particular brand of clowning. Their dumb antics in handling their tools and each other are a succession of side splitters. The climax is a knockout. See it for yourself and see if we've misled you. And finally, from the Exhibitors Herald World, May 4th, 1929, this comes from the Opera House, Louisville, Nebraska. Another scream from these boys. If only we could show a comedy every night as good as this one. Many good comments, and a few folks asked us when we were going to show another of this pair. Laurel and Hardy's star status was ascending rapidly, and the boys were enjoying the most prosperous period of their careers to date. Privately, their lives were following different paths, as Babe began to understand the level of his wife Myrtle's problems with alcohol, a problem that, despite their love for each other, would eventually be too much for their marriage to endure. Stan, on the other hand, became a father during the filming of The Finishing Touch. His wife, Lois, gave birth to a little girl, also named Lois, on December the 10th. As 1927 closed, Laurel and Hardy were riding high and gaining in popularity, a trend that would continue throughout the following year. As Craig Kalman's book, 100 Years of Brodies with Hal Roach, informs us, this was the most profitable period financially for the Roach Studios to date. Leo McCary's considerable influence in this continuing success was duly rewarded, and in that same December he was made a vice president of the Roach Studio and also signed a new contract that awarded him a percentage of the profits from the Laurel and Hardy output. But life is anything but simple. At the start of 1928, reports appeared in the press of a separation between Hal Roach and his wife, and as the year progressed, Stan and Babe's private lives would also become ever more turbulent. Professional success, it seems, doesn't equate to personal happiness. Today's first guest on the blogcast is a man who needs no introduction, so let's just say he to give us his thoughts and more about today's film in focus. The Finishing Touch is the man who probably knows more about the films of Laurel and Hardy than anybody else. Friend of the blogcast, the wonderful Randy Scretvet. Welcome back, Randy. Hello, Patrick. Good to be here again. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. It is an absolute pleasure. And uh, I'm really glad, Randy, to have this opportunity to chat with you today about The Finishing Touch, um, because it is one of my absolute favourite Laurel and Hardy films. Not just a silent film, I would say it's probably one of my overall favourite films. So, um, you know, really, really excited to hear what you've got to say about it. Um, uh, also, because because I'm such a fan of it, uh, you know, m- the things that I will say will be very positive. But I noticed in your book... Um, you you were less than overly positive about it, um, as well as William K. Was, as well as William K. Everson as yeah. well. Um, Everson Everson described it as a slight disappointment and somewhat mechanical. Um, you weren't you weren't too uh, negative. You said it was a pleasant enough little picture. No, it's it's um, a pleasant enough little picture. It's I think it suffers from the fact that so many other comedians after Laurel and Hardy have done the same type of routines. Uh, So I think there's familiarity, which is not the fault of the finishing touch, nor of Laurel and Hardy. It's simply that this was such surefire material that the Three Stooges and probably Lucy and Ethel and everybody else uh, borrowed from it or did similar material. And so it seems uh, well worn to us today, even though I'm sure it didn't in 1928 when it was released. So... uh, 
But, uh, however, I will say that Stan Laurel was also rather slightly disappointed in it. Uh, he wrote, you know, even when he was right in the thick of becoming very popular and very famous worldwide, he still had time to write to fans. And uh, uh, there are several letters. Uh, if you go to Bernie Hoje's website, uh, Letters from Stan, um, there was a fellow by the name of Duncan Boss. And uh, I don't think they had any uh, relationship outside of the fact that Duncan Boss was a fan who occasionally wrote to Stan and Stan would, was cordial enough to write back. And there is a letter from April 24th of 1928. And I quote, uh, I note in your letters that you have been keeping in close touch with our comedies and ampersand. Stan always uses an ampersand because he was a hunt and peck typist. <laughs> and am and am delighted to know that you like them so well. It certainly is encouraging, and your criticism is greatly appreciated. Very many thanks. Glad you liked the finishing touch. We were kind of disappointed with it here, felt that it wasn't up to our standard. Maybe it's good that we feel that way sometimes, makes us try to do better. Of course, we can't expect to do knockouts every time, <laughs> especially as we make a picture in eight to ten days, and ideas for material don't come easy. Easy, so we must consider ourselves pretty lucky up to now. So uh, that was Stan himself didn't think it was one of the, the highest achievements that they'd done. But it's not to say that it's a bad movie, and it, it's surefire audience material. Yes, it absolutely is. Is uh, I mean, I think that also just I, I mentioned this in my blog. You know, it, it it shows what a high bar they've 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 set themselves at such yeah. an early point to be yes. disappointed with that. I just think is is incredible, really. But uh, yeah. fair play. Yes. To Watch, them. Watching the film again uh, last night and again this morning, I was really struck by the fact that how completely they are Stan and Ollie with yeah. with the way that they interact and all the little mannerisms of Ollie's finger gestures and expressions and the way that they move with each other uh, uh, and I thought this is what the seventh film that they'd made since the second hundred years because I, I, I always count the second hundred years as being the, the one where Leo McCary probably went to Hal Roach and said okay let's start developing a series with just these two because the previous film is Sugar Daddies, which clearly is not a standard Laurel and Hardy film. And, you know, the, all the films prior to Second Hundred Years had been sort of groping toward a Laurel and Hardy teaming. But, boy, once they're in Second Hundred Years from then on, they are teamed in everything they do from that point on. So this is the seventh film after that. And this is made in November of 1927. Second Hundred Years was June. So this is five months after that. And already... They are Laurel and Hardy with the spit curls for Ollie and the, the children's derby for Stan. And you would have think this would have been made maybe three or four years after Second Hundred Years. It's just phenomenal how quickly they developed. Yeah, they're very, very complete. Um, and, and also, I think because I guess because of the nature of the finishing touch, it is very much, you know, it's, it's the overall picture. They're just completing a house. It's very knockabout stuff. Yeah. There's no, I mean, there's no kind of emphasis on the relationship between the two as we see in other films which i guess is a little bit of a um to its not to its detriment not that that's not that's the wrong word but um there's also less chance for stan to be um because you know in the next film from soup to nuts he he has that sort of aggressive streak yeah that comes out that's sort which of solo little, stan that's kind of unusual yeah and he does that yeah. little kick that little scissors kick also yeah. <laughs> which is something right. that he did a lot as a solo comedian but not very much as yeah. stanley in laurel and hardy but no, there you you do get to see the relationship between them in finishing touch because, you know, Stan is always putting a very small, unsub, insubstantial plank of wood underneath <laughs> a heavier yes. one, which Ollie then doesn't understand. It is not going to be uh, firm enough for him to walk across to get from the uh, ground to the house, and he's always breaking through it. Uh, or, or Stan is always borrowing the block of wood that Ollie needs to stand on, or or <laughs> or uh, uh, Ollie's sitting on the plank of wood which Stan is sawing away and and doesn't realize that when he does this, Ollie's going to fall. So yeah, you do get a lot of of gags that are based on their uh, miscommunication. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, that's very true. I I have to say though, my favorite moment in the whole movie is when Stan is trying to count on his gloved hand and he's <laughs> counting on his fingers 
and he hasn't put one of his fingers into the finger of the glove, so it's just this empty fabric, and he suddenly gets very frightened that he's missing one of his fingers, and he, <laughs> he, he, he takes the glove off, and all he has to show him, no, your finger's right there, you know, that's and I thought, right. I thought, now that's a, that's a true Laurel and Hardy moment, you know, that's something yes. that other comedians wouldn't do, and yeah. it's nice that they got something like that into this picture, that's not just standard knockabout that everybody did that you could do with yeah. the three stooges or dickens and fenster on television or whoever you know i mean that's that's a uh, a genuine unique laurel and hardy moment yes that's very true, uh, very yeah. true. i think my my sort of favorite clips are um, as you say when 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 ollie's walking across the the, the sort of the, the platform to get onto yeah. the, the porch <laughs> Um, and then he goes down and he, he sort of looks up and there's that look to stand as if to say, did you move that? Or did you, <laughs> it's, the, yeah. it's those looks that he gives him, but just yeah. classic. Yeah. Um, and, and the other, the other little part is where Stan is trying to fit that window frame and it just collapses around. That is just such a perfect, yeah. perfect moment. Yeah. The way that it disassembles itself and he, he hits the floor is just wonderful. Absolutely and and wonderful. doing that sort of, of physical material with props and to do it gracefully and and in a funny way, as Marcel Marceau said, it's it's uh, very difficult to do uh, to do it in a funny way. Uh, and Laurel and Hardy work very very well with props, uh, and they get a lot of mileage out of props too. You know, you, there's obviously stuff with ladders. Um, yeah. They don't quite get as much mileage out of ladders as the Three Stooges do. Now, when the Three Stooges, the Three Stooges being three of them, get a lot of mileage out of carrying a ladder crossways because the curly will hit mo with one edge of the ladder and then and he'll oh and then he'll turn around and say like what did i do and he'll hit larry behind him and you know they don't just do it once they do it four or five or six times they get a lot of mileage out of one gag um laurel and hardy don't quite do that but they do things like uh, stan having the pail of nails on the edge of his shovel and he doesn't realize where it's gone yes. you know that's yeah. a that's a funny moment also they do the um as Leo McCary called it a fantasy gag where uh, as Stan is, is on one end of a plank of wood and he's carrying it past Edgar Kennedy, the cop. And it's a long, 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 long plank of wood. And then at the end of it, there's Stan again, you know, so that's a kind of a cartoonish gag. I always watch the shadows to see if I can figure out. <laughs> Stan obviously was well out of camera range before he went behind the camera. Yeah. And, the, and I'm going, well, who who was carrying the plank of wood while he wasn't there? That's Probably right. my friend Thomas Benton Roberts, who was on the crew and who I interviewed. So he, one of the prop guys, anyway, was carrying it. Um, and they liked that gag because it's, it's one of the few things that they did uh, that are authentic Laurel and Hardy and Great Guns. So you see that yes. gag again in 1941. By the way, uh, speaking not only of, of people who did this type of material after the finishing touch, um, Stan Laurel had pretty much done it before uh, in yeah. a film called Smithy, uh, which is all about house construction. So there are some similar yeah. gags in that. Uh, including the uh, sawing the plank of the guy who's sitting on the other end of it. I think that's in Smithy as well. Yeah, and, I think it's on the other end, isn't it? Is it probably, yeah. yeah and yeah. and uh, uh, also, I, I think there's some similarity between this and um, uh, Stick Around, uh, the short that Oliver Hardy made with Bobby Ray, which is – uh, shockingly like an embryonic Laurel and Hardy movie. Uh, you know, Ollie's got a derby and the little, uh, he looks very much like uh, Ollie Wood in 1925. And Bobby Ray is a very uh, similar character to the Stan Laurel that we know. He's, he's wearing a little derby and he's kind of a little put upon guy. <laughs> and you look at that and you go, wow, there is a, a, a predecessor, a clear predecessor to Laurel and Hardy, far more so than you find in most of Oliver Hardy's solo movies. So, but anyway, there's there's a similar, you know, carpentry assembling type of knockabout comedy in that as well. So, yeah, I mean that's a that's a good place to come back to because I think if you know starting starting from the beginning, um, I know some some people some some books have said that the finishing touch is a remake of of Smithy and and other films, and I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. They they certainly certainly lifted gags, and I know the. Um, 
the, the where Ollie gets the mouthful of nails. I mean, that's used in uh, Stan's The Egg, I think it is. Uh-huh. Um, and, and also in Smithy. That's that's also used in both of those films. <laughs> does, does, does anybody do that outside of two real comedies? <laughs> exactly. I, well, how is I that have a good never idea? heard of a real person <laughs> kicking him up and, and going to, like he's going to spit them so accurately that the point of the nail is going to go exactly where he wants it <laughs> in the plank of wood. I, I have never seen that on This Old House or any other program about carpentry. No. <laughs> No. no, I think I think Ollie must have had holes in his pockets and no tool belt. I think that must have been it. He had no way to carry those. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm sure when he was doing the gag, he was just just doing pushing his cheeks out with exactly. air, and, uh, exactly, and not not really swallowing a mouthful of nails, but making it look <laughs> as as uh, as close to it as possible. I know John McCabe as well. Just talking about the, the sort of the genesis of the film in in John McCabe's uh, first book, Mister Laurel, and Mister Hardy. He he quote I think it was. A, quote from Stan but he was telling that a gag man happened to be passing a, a construction site and noticed this house that was being partially built um, and he brought some ideas from that to the gag yeah. session and from yeah. there the, the idea so I think it I don't think I wouldn't call it a remake I think it's been yeah. heavily it heavily borrows let's say from from others well it, 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 when you look around the neighborhood in the finishing touch you can see that there were a lot of things that were under construction uh, you can also see that in bacon grabbers uh, so th- that part of uh, Southern California was not yet overdeveloped. Um, and in fact, there is a, there's a house, a, a large, very ornate house uh, in the background. And let me see if I can find the address of it for you, because uh, it's still there. Um, uh, well, I can tell you one thing, that where they did shoot most of the finishing touch would be on or near the corner of Motor Avenue and Club Drive in Cheviot Hills, which is right near where the Roach Studio was. So 2826 Motor Avenue would be the closest that we could come to the the parcel on which uh, the finishing touch was made. Uh, yes, there's there's a very distinctive and very ornate house in the background in some shots. That's still standing. And for those of you who want to do a Google uh, Street View search, uh, that is at 2839 Forrester Drive in Cheviot Hills. So that's still there. Uh, and also... Uh, you know, I always say movies make their own geography. Uh, you know, the most extreme example of that would be the Orson Welles movie of Othello, where he has uh, a shot of one character made in 1949 in Italy, and the reaction shot is 1959 in Spain, uh, or 1951 <laughs> in Spain. So there, there are there are two shot uh, scenes which are two years apart, but right. you don't notice because that's the way movies ma- are uh, made. Um, but the the, the uh, sanitarium which is supposed to be right across the street from where Laurel and Hardy are noisily working. And that's why Dorothy Coburn is the nurse is so upset and wants them to be quiet because they're in such close proximity. Well, actually that building was a private home and it's three blocks Northeast of the Laurel and Hardy location. And that's still standing. Also, it's at 2728 McConnell drive. So, uh, and I suspect since that was really a private home, it probably belonged to somebody who either worked at the studio or who was a a personal friend of Hal Roach. Um, Because whenever they had to use a private home, it always made more sense to uh, canvas the employees and say, hey, anybody want to make a few extra bucks by letting us use your house? (laughs) You know, because, for example, the Perfect Day house belonged to a guy who was an electrician. Uh, at the Hal Roach Studios, and and big business belonged to uh, William Terhune, who was part of the editing staff. So, you know, it just made made more sense. You, you know, if you worked at the studio, you understood that there yes. probably would be some uh, 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 damage done, but it would all be paid for and all repaired because there were first class craftsmen and carpenters at the Hal Roach Studios. In fact, that's another thing that uh, amazes me about the finishing touches: that studio crew built you know, what house there was. Yeah, so I believe, yeah. <laughs> and, That's and, incredible. And even though it's unfinished, they're st- they could have finished it <laughs> and made <laughs> yeah. a fairly substantial house. Uh, so, you know, uh, they, they, the, the, the both interiors and exteriors in the Hal Roach films, and particularly the silence when money was not quite so tight, uh, always impressed me uh, tremendously. Um uh, uh, you know, I, and I think especially after Hal Roach had a distribu- distribution deal with Metro Goldwyn Mayer rather than Pathé, because Metro Goldwyn Mayer, even though they'd only been around since 1924, they had become the 
uh, most prestigious of the movie studios, and they wanted everything to be first class, including the short subjects. And so uh, Roach had to reflect that and make sure that his films did not look inexpensive. And they they certainly don't. And when we so uh, anyway, that that impressed me too. The fact that they really did build <laughs> three three quarters of a house for that film. And didn't they? Uh, I think I'm sure I read, read this in in your book, Randy. That the that that finale gag where they have to destroy the house. Did that go wrong? Am I right in that? Well, that's what I was told by Thomas Benton Roberts. Right now, he was part of the Roach prop crew. And uh, one of the nice things about uh, helping to run a Sons of the Desert tent, uh, which I did in Orange County starting in 1973, is that people find out about you and they come out of the woodwork and they say, well, I worked on the films and da, da, da. So that's how Thomas Benton Roberts came into our sphere. He lived in Long Beach, which was, it's about 10 miles away from where I am now. So he, right. he, he and his wife Lois came to our meetings and I eventually did a formal in- interview with him at his home. And, uh, yes, he was part of the prop crew, uh, worked a lot with a man named Charlie Olsey, who did all the uh, funny props for the R Gang Kids. And uh, uh, Thomas Benton Roberts also did a lot of the breakaway cars for not only for Laurel and Hardy, but for, for two Tars particularly. And that's why he was rewarded with a role in the film. He's the man with the dark uh, sunglasses, oh, the glitter glasses. And, the, yeah. and the fedora hat and who throws the tomatoes at uh, Harry Bernard, the truck driver. <laughs> So anyway, he worked on this picture and uh, he said that uh, the the initial idea was for, you know, Laurel and Hardy are are fighting over this rock, which has been supporting the truck, keeping the truck from rolling backward. Well, they they pulled away from the truck and it starts unbeknownst to them as they're fighting in the background. It starts rolling, 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 rolling right toward the house. And it was supposed to go right through it and just make a big hole in the house. And evidently, Benton Roberts told me that he said, well, the the crew didn't quite follow my instructions. And as a result, it didn't go all the way through. It just sort of fell into the middle of it. And the house sort of collapses upward like a house of cards. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's a shot you can't do again. (laughs) it's like you know the camera crew for buster keaton's the general when the when the uh, <laughs> train is going across the trestle the burning trestle and collapses into the river you know it's like oh, bus we didn't quite get it <laughs> can we get it can we get another one you know <laughs> yeah. that was a bit so, of stressful so, take yeah. so uh, yeah i wonder if they had you know more than just the two cameras on that shot uh, be, you know, because sometimes there are the you can only do it once shots uh, 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 in my in my book, in the in the chapter, the early chapter, just about Babe and his pre-team work. Uh, Babe was a uh, an assistant director uh, on a, a Larry Seaman comedy called Stop, Look and Listen. And there's a shot of him. He's just in his street clothes and he's overseeing this shot. And there's five cameras, five guys with silent cameras all together, clustered together. And I said, well, I don't know what it is that they're photographing, but obviously this was a, you can only get it once. So that's why they have coverage. You know, they got five different negatives on it <laughs> in, in case something goes wrong. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, it did not quite go to plan. It was supposed to go all the way through instead of stopping and having the house be like this, you know, uh, house of cards. But Stan was not upset about it. He said, well, you know, maybe he, he told Benton Roberts, he said, well, you know, maybe, maybe it'll just be funnier that way. And it really doesn't suffer. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, it made the point. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it looks great. Yeah. You, yeah, you see, yeah. You, you certainly wouldn't know it, uh, it had gone wrong. And it also kind of gets the, gets the idea across that the truck has been destroyed too. Yes. <laughs> which yes, which yes. might not have been the case had the truck just gone sailing all the way through, see? So I think maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Was ever thus. Uh, and, and it must have been a very physically difficult film, I think, for the boys to make as well. But there's so much knockabout stuff in that. A lot of, lot of falls. A lot of falling yeah. into, into mud onto the ground. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and, uh, I, well, Babe's Widow Lucille... And uh, she would be the one to know. And she said that Babe's body had uh, little bumps and permanent scars all over it, which were souvenirs of uh, the knockabout things that he did in slapstick comedies. And I'm sure he earned a few permanent ones on this picture, too. In fact, uh, uh, so did Edgar Kennedy. 
Edgar Kennedy takes an awful lot of physical abuse too, um, <laughs> yeah. falling and also at one point getting covered with glue and uh, 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 sh shingles from the roof that have fallen. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, when you think about that and you think that also previously he'd been in uh, Leave Him Laughing, where he's out in actual Culver City traffic with his trousers down, uh, <laughs> suffering that kind, of, and 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 taking a mud bath at the end of the film when the when the Model T sinks yes. into the big sinkhole, um, you figure it's it's no surprise that he only wanted to be behind the camera for, <laughs> for Laurel and Hardy's next two pictures because he's the director only on From Soup to Nuts and You're Darn Tootin', and I kind of think. I can understand <laughs> saying, <laughs> yeah. I have to work with Laurel and Hardy again. Um, I haven't quite recovered from that last yeah. picture. How about I'm behind the camera this time? <laughs> and he had, in fact, directed quite a bit in the 20s. There was, there was a period of his career when he was not doing a lot of uh, acting and was primarily a director. So these two were not flukes. He, he was an experienced director. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, yeah, he, he took a lot of punishment and Dorothy Coburn also, maybe not quite to the same extreme, but she does fall into a, a vat of whitewash. That's a nasty fall, isn't it? That, is, yeah, that goes yeah. through me every time. Well, yeah. She, she knew how to take it because she was from Montana. There, that's a, that's a, a prominent name in Montana, Coburn. And, uh, uh, her father had, uh, uh, produced and acted in Western movies, so she came from a movie background, so she was no stranger to this. She was also an accomplished horsewoman. She, she could ride and rope with the best of them, and as a result, she did stunt work for, for Westerns, and I think for, for male performers as well as female. So you figure, you know, being a stunt woman in Westerns, this was probably a day in the park for her. You know, I don't have to ride a horse. I don't have to fall off a horse. Okay, fine. You know, I'll fall off a bat of whitewash. Good. You know, when's lunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising they didn't use her even more for stunts, really, in, in the right shooters, because she's obviously a real asset. Yeah. Now, in later years, she was also, I understand she was a stand-in for Ginger Rogers, which rather surprises me, because I would think that she would be rather significantly shorter than Ginger, but you never know. So, yeah. But anyway, yes, they all took a lot of physical abuse on this picture. But and that, too, is one reason why this one was uh, almost twice the length of production time. It's oh, okay. Yeah. Quite you know, they were really putting films out very, very quickly at this point. I, I think... I, they, they did something like 23 films over 1928, 29 and through there. Uh, and, and as Stan mentioned in the letter, they, you know, they made a picture every seven or eight days. Well, this one took 15 uh, just of shooting, uh, you know, half, half the month of November. And that's a long time for a Laurel and Hardy two reeler of that, of that time. Uh, so I, I imagine that the physical, stuff uh it doesn't seem to be any weather delays according to what i have on the on the uh, production reports it just seems like it just took a long time to film and that's also probably one reason why they uh they brought along some of the comforts of home on the location even though the location was not very far away uh they brought his uh, his portable radio there's oh, yes. there, there's a picture of it in the book uh yes. and what what was that now i've got the the name of it uh, it was a, a super heterodyne or something like that. Uh, yeah, here it is. An, uh, an RCA Radiola 24 portable super heterodyne. Now, portable in those days is, <laughs> is a radio that's about two feet wide and has yeah. this big rectangular antenna <laughs> on top of it. But you can imagine that in 1928, the ability to listen to radio without having to put on headphones or having the big horn out of it. That was quite a novelty. That was the, the latest thing. So Babe was quite proud of this new toy of his. And then Stan brought along his St. Bernard named Lady. Yes. And he yeah. evidently brought Lady along to other locations too because uh, uh, I have a story about Lady being on location for With Love and Hisses. Uh, oh, okay. He he'd brought Lady along and uh, uh, just, just for companionship. And um, during With Love and Hisses, the guys played a trick on Stan. They took out the distributor cap of his car, and he was trying to get his car started. And the lady was barking, barking, barking. He says, lady, lady, shh, I'm trying to get this thing started. So, <laughs> so they remembered lady being on location. Hey, boy, I'm going to get my dog. You've gotten us into enough trouble. I'll do it. 
And there's there are also a couple of very cute stills where uh, a kitten just happened to wander onto the location. Yes. And there's yeah. one with the, the, the kitten on top of the camera. Babe's yeah. looking at the, the camera. The kitten's on the camera. And there's another one just of Stan holding the kitten and smiling. So yeah. I don't know yeah, if, I don't know if they if anybody on the crew kept it. <laughs> I hope so. I'd like to think that somebody found a home for it. But uh, you know, those things happen on location. Yeah, but there are some. I mean, you know, talking about the the behind the scenes stills, there are so many for this film. Yeah, one. Well, it's a long, it's a long shoot. Stills. That's why. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but they all they always seem to be having such a fantastic time as well. They genuinely look like they're having a good time. Dorothy Coburn and and the boys especially. Dorothy Coburn looking like she's just having an uproariously funny time, just just yeah. between takes. As yes. they're sitting in their little yeah. canvas chairs, waiting for the next shot to be set up, yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, it looks as though they had a a, a good. And uh, Stan was very much aware of that. Stan liked to keep the sets happy, and that's why there were practical jokes and things. I did notice the last time I went through the um, the payrolls, the Hal Roach payroll ledgers at at uh, USC. Uh, I was going through silent era Laurel and Hardy things, and just noticing that on the crew. Every picture, uh, Sammy Brooks was always part of the Laurel and Hardy unit. Now, Sammy Brooks was a little guy who had been with the Roach Studio since about 19, oh, 1917, 1918. And he was a little guy. I don't, I think he was about three foot six. Uh, not quite, not quite a dwarf or a midget, but but not tall at all. Uh, you can see him in birthmarks. He, they almost uh, sit on him. Yes, and he's a little guy. Hey, see. and he's a little bald guy. You know, <laughs> that's right. Well, that's yeah. Sammy Brooks, and he was always. He's never in the pictures, but he's always on the payroll. And I thought, right. aha, he's a guy like Bobby Barber was for Abbott and Costello. Bobby Barber was the 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 stooge. Uh, to have uh, seltzer bottles sprayed at and uh, have uh, things happen to him or to just be funny and uh, help keep the set lively. And that that's, that's not unusual for comedy units to want somebody like that to relieve the tedium that happens, you know, for the long stretches when they're setting up the lights or you got to do another take and it can be very arduous. And so to keep the mood light and happy and in a, in a funny frame of mind, you have people like that who are on the payroll, you know, at like Mel Brooks originally was a what they called a pool tumbler. And they, he worked at hotels in New York. And it was just a guy to be funny and amuse the people who were paying to be there at this resort. And he just do gags and funny shtick. Well, you have the same type of thing happening with the Laurel and Hardy unit with Stammy Brooks. And uh, I'm, I'm sure he must have been there on the on the set or on the location. But uh, anyway, it seems to have been, even though it was a long shoot and in many ways a, a physically arduous and unpleasant one, it seems to have been uh, an enjoyable one as much as they yeah. could make it. Yeah, so no, it certainly seems to be. Yeah, and, uh, and and just a great supporting cast. I think Edgar Kennedy and Dorothy Coburn are so good in that film. Yeah, really, really good. And it's and it's just them. <laughs> They're yeah. the only two. Now, yeah. the the script had a different idea. Uh, instead of having Dorothy Coburn, uh, the original script proposed that it be uh, a physician, a doctor, uh, who worked at the sanitarium, who was uh, having you know difficulty keeping things quiet with all the the noise going on across the street. And I think it actually is funnier having it be a very diminutive but very tough little nurse. You know, yes. uh, the fact that she can boss Laurel and Hardy around when she's about a foot and a half shorter than Laura, than Hardy is, uh, yes. you know, I think that's very effective. Uh, yeah. And she's yeah. a, you wouldn't mess with her. No. And she's a very <laughs> capable comedian. She's very expressive. Uh, you yeah. know, she carries herself well. And especially when the scene when they pretend that, that, that Stan rips some uh, some sandpaper and uh, <laughs> to make it sound as though Dorothy's uh, dress is torn when she when she bends over and she does yeah. this wonderful take. Yeah, you know, and yeah, she looks very frightened right. as, as she backs away because she doesn't want anybody to see. You yeah. know, and, of course, yeah. <laughs> and then the boys do this yeah. little hop skip because they finally put one over on her. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's lovely. It's like they're Ollie, she 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 looks at Ollie's face to see if and, and he's oh! yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and Ollie, does, this Ollie does this gesture to indicate the 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 wide uh, length of the tear of, of the fabric. You know, oh, okay. it's this big. You know, <laughs> and then they do their little hop skip together, like we did it, we did it. We're so happy. You know. <laughs> 
Oh, brilliant. That's oh, yeah. Really that, and that's another personal little moment, too, you know, where they were able to inject something yes. that's unique that's to their true. relationship into what is a, a pretty basic uh, knockabout comedy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the first of, uh, I, I guess you call them the, I, I would call them the overalls movies, uh, even though Ollie isn't wearing overalls. Stan is, but Ollie isn't. But, uh, you know, later on you had uh, the music box and Toad in a Hole and uh, Busy Bodies and Dirty Work, you know, where they're doing uh, the, you know, physical labor. Uh, and so that's just part of the job, you know? Uh, so we, we don't, we don't see those uniforms as often as we do the usual, uh, Stan's, uh, t- tweed coat and all these darker coat, but, uh, you see them frequently enough, you know? There was another uh, difference in the script too. Um, in the movie, uh, it's rather poetic, actually, the the way that the uh, destruction of the house begins and the house's self-destruction. <laughs> There's a little bird, a little animated sparrow. And, and I suspect that the animation was done by Roy Seawright because uh, he was doing this sort of thing. Um, I, I'm quite sure that he also did the flying elephants because, because he said to me, well, they were very crude and amateurish. But he said that he did them. Now, for some reason, there are some people who say Walter Lance did them, but that doesn't make any sense because Walter Lance had no affiliation with the Rogue Studios, not even with distribution. So why would he, uh, you know, the, the, the Roach Studio didn't need animation all that frequently, but when they did, Roy Seawright was perfectly capable of doing it. Uh, Roy also did the little uh, cartoon mouse for Bratz. Uh, the little oh, yeah. the little mouse on Ollie on a still of Ollie's rear end, you know, as he's <laughs> uh, leaning over. Uh, then they have this cartoon <laughs> mouse that squeaks and then dashes away. Well, that's Roy Seawright's animation. Also, um, uh, the sparks uh, in uh, Hogwild when Ollie's up on the roof and Stan plug, plugs in the, uh, the the wire on the battery. Uh, those are just those are just lines that just drawn right onto the negative. Uh, you know, physically just take a black piece, uh, black fan, a pen and draw on the negative. And that's all they did because it'll print out white. So uh, that was easy. So that, that, that didn't take any uh, real uh, uh, effort. But uh, anyway, I'm sure that Roy was the guy who animated this little sparrow who alights on the chimney. And that is evidently such a great burden on the house <laughs> <laughs> that it begins to groan and creak and, the panels start to fall out and windows. <laughs> and of course, this is this is just after Sam Lufkin, the homeowner, has arrived and has been so pleased at the final result. And now he's seeing it's almost like Call of the Cuckoo all over again. You know, you, yes, get, yeah. you, you wonder how st- it's obviously we know that most houses in the 20s were pretty sturdily built because there's still a lot of them around today, particularly in that area. But uh, there must have been some which were not quite so well constructed. <laughs> so but but in the script, uh, Stan was supposed to realize that he'd left his derby on top of the roof. Right. And so he was right. going to go clamber on top of it and get his hat. Well, that makes more sense. The weight of a man on top of the roof causing yeah. the house to collapse. So to have it just be a little sparrow on the chimney uh, is a, is a better gag. You know, it's it's more it's more extreme and therefore it's yes. funnier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's another ridiculous. another variation from the script. Also, I think they in the script they mentioned that the the homeowner. Uh, what was it? He was going to go on his honeymoon or he was about to be married or something. And he wanted this to be a, a wedding present or something like that. Um, let's see. I'm looking at my script here. Uh, oh, the, the reason that they quit the uh, uh, original construction crew had stopped working on the house midway was because of the complaints from the uh, sanitarium originally. And uh, oh, the script also suggests that perhaps the homeowner explains that he's being married the next day and wants the home ready for his wife. Okay. So that's why they have to have it ready by noon tomorrow. So, right, all right. So, right. so now we know that, even though that's not in the film. <laughs> so congratulations to Sam Lufkin and his happy bride. 
Yes, and I love that little um, the little game of catch with the with the, oh. with the money at the end as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. very accurate as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, it, they almost it almost threatens to get into a you know a, a rock throwing battle or something where they're uh, you know uh, going to be like should married men go home? Another one of those. It never quite develops into that uh, happily, um, but there is the gag at the end where. Um, uh, it was it St- Stan throws a rock from way in the background, and <laughs> yeah. and you see the two hats fly off. You That's know, right. Yeah, courtesy yeah, of courtesy good. of two prop men pulling wires outside of the camera range. <laughs> no, uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. <laughs> you're, well, you're ruining you know, the magic of it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they they do similar gags in uh, birthmarks and uh, at the end of Swiss Miss, and uh, that, yes, that was a that was a favorite wrap up gag. The idea of throwing something from far away and having it have a a, you know, <laughs> a yeah. repercussion. <laughs> It works very well, very very well, and uh, and Stan Stan became a father, I believe, as well in in the middle of the shooting of this. Is that right? Oh yes, yes, uh, yeah. Lois was born. Uh, let's see, she was, I believe, December tenth of nineteen twenty seven, and um, yeah, and so uh, this this is midway through the filming of the short, um, because the filming days were. I said November, but actually it was it was written in late November. This was filmed Friday, December second through Saturday, December seventeenth, and usually they did take Sundays off. So anyway, uh, roughly a, a two week schedule on this. And yes, Lois was born December tenth of nineteen twenty seven, and also uh, an, another uh, landmark for Laurel and Hardy, although not one personally as important to Stan Laurel. Um, the first known. Uh, uh, personal appearance that Laurel and Hardy did on stage uh, happened uh, just before they finished filming this movie. Uh, it was on, on Thursday, December 15th, and they appeared at the Los Angeles Shrine Auditorium, uh, which still stands. Uh, it had been opened the previous year in 1926, and it's still used as a venue for concerts and movies and shows. So it was uh, built much better than the house for the finishing touch. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the 1920s buildings, which we still have in Los Angeles. And uh, they did a, uh, a, a w- what one reviewer called a lively skit. And it was the 14th annual Christmas benefit sponsored by the Los Angeles Examiner, which had uh, among the luminaries there, uh, Clara Bow, Gary Cooper, Joan Crawford, Marie Dressler, and 300 other stars. So nobody must have had much time on stage. They probably all just showed up and waved. But the people that we would care about would be uh, William Austin, who is the butler in uh, Laurel and Hardy murder case. Uh, Fred Kelsey, who is the, uh, uh, the detective in Laurel and Hardy murder case. Uh, Clyde Cook, uh, an associate of Laurel and Hardy's for many, many years. Uh, Thelma Todd was there, and also the Our Gang Kids. So those would be the people that we would care about more so maybe than Gary Cooper or Clara Bow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forget Clara Bow. I audience. want to see Fred Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really would. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Oh, that's great. And also, um, towards, uh, if, if I'm right as well, it, uh, Hal Roach was having a bit of relationship problems just at, to around the time when the film was released and there was a rumored split with his wife. Well, he went on a uh, tour around the world for about six months at this, at this highly critical time when Laurel and Hardy were just really coming into their own. Now you, you can bet that he kept close tabs on what was happening at the studio. He was not uh, in an effort to not be divorced from his wife, he was also not being divorced from his studio. So uh, however close he could be in other far-flung locales around the globe, uh, I'm, I'm sure he was uh, kept apprised of what was happening. Uh, after all, MGM did have distribution channels all over the world, so I'm sure there was somebody there uh, that he could contact to keep him apprised of what was happening. And uh, even though he probably wasn't able to look at dailies, <laughs> we, we didn't have Zoom. You know, if we had Zoom capability, then he could have said, OK, show me what we shot yesterday, you know, which he normally would do. Normally, every morning he would look at every day's previous footage and, uh, you know, and, and OK it or not OK it. So that was for, for every film that they were producing on the, on yeah, the studio. He wow. and uh, and uh, well, if he didn't do it at this point, Leo McCary would have. Yeah, because he yeah. was he was supervising director of everything, uh, and and as he told Peter Bogdanovich, he said, you know, that meant 
everything from sitting in at writers' meetings to going to previews to looking at the dailies to supervising editing. You know, I just oversaw the making of everything. And uh, seeing as how there were usually four pictures in production at any one time at this point with the Hal Roach Studios, it was a very, very, probably the busiest time ever for the studio was 1926 through 30, you know, and of course things things slowed down a bit when the depression came in. So, you know, you, uh, you kind of had one picture at a time at that point, uh, rather than four pictures at a time. But uh, anyway, Roach kept close tabs. Roach always came to the previews. Um, Venice Lloyd told me about that entire process. And also Richard Courier. And, uh, you know, if you want to, whenever you want to talk about that, we can talk about that in detail, the whole preview process. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, we'll certainly we'll certainly come on to that. That sounds yeah. perfect. And by the way, by the way, speaking speaking of Laurel and Hardy films that maybe are not always as highly regarded as others, uh, I call dibs on Early to Bed. <laughs> You're on. You're I, on. I want to I yes. do Early to Bed, and I'd also like to do Wrong Again. Not a problem. Because because not a problem. because I was just thinking about this. You know, what are pictures that have particularly fascinating histories that you might not think about when you're seeing the film? You know, with other pictures, you just you realize you just go looking at it. You just go, well, this had to be a an amazing movie to make. Well, early to bed doesn't seem like it, but it had a really interesting backstory. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that that sounds really because I, I, I mean, I think I'm probably the similar to yourself. It's one that I just I do not like. No, I do not like. I don't to like bed. it either. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, because there are people who think it's just wonderful. And uh, if if do you have the book by Charles Barr? The, yes, I do. Yes, yeah. he gives it four stars. And, and, you know, he just thinks it's, you know, brilliant, brilliant film. And I just, how do you see that? What are you looking at? You know, please explain to me how it's brilliant because I don't see that. But anyway, we'll, we'll leave that for that time. Not, not that we ever want to badmouth Laurel and Hardy, but, you know, just as I say, just to satisfy the law of averages, there has to be a clinker once in a while. <laughs> they yeah, can't it's, all a be, it's a critique. It's <laughs> a critique. Know, yeah. They can't all be brilliant. I'm pretty sure I had a conversation with Richard Ban online about early because I think he's a fan of early to bed as well. He, yeah, he doesn't understand why we, uh, I get so upset at it. <laughs> he, he says I find I find it an enjoyable change of pace. I said, well, all right, that's good. Yeah, Some, but that, that's what to. I love. That's that's why I, I, I do like that. Yeah. I think that's great that people do love it because you know I'd hate to think that there's a film that nobody likes. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's great that you know we, we have. We oh yeah, there are in, people uh, there are people who love the Fox films, you know, and uh, yeah. I said, well, they they all have have moments and some and some are better than others and i think gradually they did get better uh i, I think the, the the final three are better than the first three uh but uh you know i, I wouldn't say that they're top-notch laurel and hardy by any means you know but there are other people say well they're the first ones i saw so i have a special affection for them and uh, you know people have their own individual ways of reacting to movies so or otherwise known as there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right, I've got you down. I've written that down. Wrong again, early to bed. That's great. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, take um, the, I'll shoulder the blame for that one. When, <laughs> when, when the firestorm of controversy erupts about early to bed, I will, I will, I'm uh, happy to shoulder that for you. Wonderful. That's good. I'll hide behind you, sir. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I think unless you have anything else, I think we might have exhausted the finishing touch. Um, wonderful film. Really, uh, really, really enjoyed to hear what you got to say about it, Randy. So thank you so much for sharing that. The, the, the only thing I have left to say about it is that, uh, as I say, uh, you know, before I do anything like this, I, tr I do look at the films a couple of times, as well as going over my notes. And I was just looking at the print quality on both the uh, American uh, DVD, which came out oh close to 20 years ago from a company called Image, and the British DVD, which is in the box set, the big 21 DVD box set yep. from Universal. And uh, in neither case is the quality of that film what you would call pristine. Uh, the, there are sections in the American DVD that look a little bit better. I suspect they were taken from, I think it's Laurel and Hardy's Laughing Twenties, is the Youngson, the Robert Youngson compilation, which uses scenes from it. And I suspect that that footage was taken from that. Uh, but they both look very, very battered and worn. And I was, I was thinking, it's been many years, it's probably been a good... Good, uh, 35 years since I've looked at my Super 8 print of the finishing touch, which I bought around 1970 or 71 from Blackhawk Films in Davenport, Iowa. But I remember my 
print, even though it was Super 8, looking much better than what is on DVD. <laughs> and uh, I suspect if I look at it now, it will look much better. And that's simply because the, the source materials were not as old or as worn back in 1970 or 71. And I don't know because I'm not in the loop as far as film archives and what their holdings are. But it may well be that at this late date, sometimes the best surviving materials on Laurel and Hardy's silence would be 16 millimeter prints made by Blackhawk back in 1968 or 69. Um, uh, I can tell you absolutely that Sugar Daddies, which looks terrible on both DVDs, my Super 8 was really nice, a real sparkler <laughs> in a beautiful print, and which was why I was shocked when I saw what was on both of the DVDs. I said, my Super 8 that's in my bedroom closet is so much better than this one. So uh, I was never able to afford 16 because I was 9 and 10, 11 years old in those days. And I didn't have the money or the space for 16 millimeter. But I suspect that if 16 mm collectors out there have prints of these, they may well be the ones that are called upon when restoration work uh, is begun. And that's that's actually happening now. I, I'm not really in the loop on this either, but I do know of uh, efforts that are being made now to uh, restore Laurel and Hardy silent films in advance of their going into the public domain uh, th three or four years from now. So I know I know someone out there right now is working on finding uh, the best source material and doing restoration work on it. So uh, I'm hoping that when these films suddenly go public domain, we'll have a happy surprise. We already have restorations done of now. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. I'm just crossing my fingers that that might happen because I, I do know that that events are happening now in anticipation of that. So. We'll, we'll see what the future brings. That's positive news. That yeah. is really good news to hear. Yeah. I, I, well, I actually keep my fingers crossed too, and maybe together we can... Uh... <laughs> We can we'll be very bad bean. typists, is what we'll <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm already one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's great. Thank you ever so much, Randy, for chatting with us today on Thank The Finishing you. Touch. It's been, it's been wonderful to uh, to catch up with you again. Thank you. And um, and hopefully um, in the next episode, we'll talk again. Uh, for, I'm planning on it. <laughs> as, <laughs> as long as my tongue <laughs> is still working. That's see, see you again soon. For he's a jolly good fellow, he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so is all of us. Let's rest a while, I'm tired. I am too. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> you know what? What? I think that fellow that sent us in here made a fool out of you. Yes, and if I ever see him again, I'll punch him right in the nose. I don't blame you. Say, I thought you said you could read character. I can, but he was two-faced. Oh. You know, I'll never trust anybody again as long as I live. That's a good idea. Now, fans of Randy need not worry. He will be back with us again on episode 16, where we look at From Soup to Nuts. Uh, but for now, let's continue our look at The Finishing Touch, and we'll go to Ontario, Canada, and we'll meet up with our next guest, Kip Harness. My second guest today has many creative strings to his bow. He is a singer, songwriter, and also an artist. And if that's not enough creativity for one man to possess, he is also an award-winning author as well. From his home in Ontario, Canada, he has written a number of books, both fiction and non-fiction, including 2007's The Art of Charlie Chaplin. But of particular importance to us today is his debut title from 2006, The Art of Laurel and Hardy, Graceful Calamity in the Films. So I'm thrilled to say that here to help us discuss Stan and Babe's 1928 silent classic, The Finishing Touch, is Kip Harness. Kip, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. Hi, Patrick. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today, Kip. It's always a thrill to uh, welcome a new guest onto the show. Um, uh, first off, I just wanted to say a big thank you to our mutual friend and former guest on the blogcast, Chris Egan, for putting us in touch. Um, really kind of him to do that. Um, 
what I'd like to do with new guests, Kip, is to start with talking a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, certainly in terms of Laurel and Hardy, if that's okay. Um, I know the, the preface in your book um, starts with your declaration that Laurel and Hardy are amongst your earliest memories, I think it said. Um, so mm. could you could you share us uh, with us those sort of memories and, and how you discovered the boys? Yeah, I, um, I guess just like everybody else through television um, and when I was a little kid, they would be on every so often. But um, as years went by, not not so much. And uh, I would do things like get up at two in the morning to see one of their films when I was a kid or set the alarm clock. And you'd see some ratty old film where, you know, their heads look like light bulbs and the <laughs> films all scratched and spliced together. Um, and then I would watch uh, on the French channel here in Canada, they'd show some and they bet that they'd be dubbed in French, but I would watch them like a loyal fan. And it, it, it seemed, uh, yeah, I, I, they seem to be kind of magical um, presence uh, and all oh, more magical because you, you couldn't see them, you know, that often when I was growing up. So, um, uh, yeah. So um, through those years, I did, uh, I guess I got in touch with the Sons of the Desert um, tent in Windsor. Uh, Derek Petro had a tent there. And um, as a just 13 year old kid, I, that was about uh, uh, an hour and a half away from where I grew up. So I'd go down there sometimes. And um, yeah, uh, there's just some, some seems to be something magical uh, about them, you know. And um, from then on, uh, I've been a fan, you know, I'll go through maybe a, a while without looking at their stuff and then I'll come back to it. That's the way it's always been through my life. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's probably true of, of all of us. It's, it, they, they're always there for us, aren't they? That's the, that's the beauty mm-hmm. of it. I think it's the, the sort of friends that remain with us throughout, throughout our lives, no matter what we're going through, which is, which is great. Yeah. So, so are you still connected with the Laurel and Hardy world today? Sons of the Desert Tents or anything, Kip? Is, is there anything that you do? No, nothing like, no, not really. Um, I, you know, look at the stuff on the internet and, uh, things and, uh, you know, I have various friends, mostly through the internet, who are big Laurel and Hardy fans. And um, but uh, uh, I, I last couple of years, I put on some uh, shows in Toronto of their films. You know, um, okay. and uh, that, the, the, a couple of those worked out pretty good. And yeah. um, but generally, uh, um, I just enjoy the films. I guess you know, come back to them every couple of years and and uh, find something yeah. new new in them you know yeah and were the were the um the film shows well attended that you you put on kip how was that uh well i did the best i could with this small kind of uh that was before covid hit and everything of course um yeah there there was a couple that were pretty good attended pretty well attended but um um yeah um there's just the joy of, of seeing them and and introducing them to people mm-hmm. yeah yeah, there's something magical about sharing it with other people, isn't it? That's the um, yeah. the comments that many people say that have watched them in, in in larger audiences in cinemas and so on. It's just something totally different, a different experience. Yeah, when you have a large audience, I know that the I've seen them with a large audience. They they do really come alive with uh, yeah. the sort of uh, incremental laughter uh, feeding on itself and uh, exponentially <laughs> flooding out. Yeah, it is a real different experience to see them. Uh, the way that they were supposed to be seen, you know, but I don't know how many opportunities we'll have to do that. But uh, yeah. Well, we, we shall see. Yeah, we shall see. I'm holding my breath at the moment, I must admit. Um, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, you, you, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the book, The Art of Laurel and Hardy, Kip. Well, I think it's really, really well written. I love the way that you analyze uh, the boys and, and, and their careers. What, what made you decide to write the book? Uh, it was just uh, one of those things where you're kind of coming back to the films again after not seeing them in a long time. And uh, it just went through my head to um, do uh, some writing on the films because of, you know, Randy Scredved's books and other ones you uh, can see. You would, the, the order that they made them in was not always the order they released them in. But if you, yeah. you know, follow that, the order that they made them in, you you can kind of see the evolution in real time. It struck me through the film. So I was interested in writing that and seeing if I could, in fact, write a whole book on all their films. You know, it was kind of a, a test I put myself to. I mean, I write songs, I write novels and things like that, fiction and stuff. It's a different type of writing. And uh, just to write kind of more of a personal uh, 
uh, eccentric kind of study of the films. And uh, so I saw if I could do it. And then I found that I did do it. And that was <laughs> great. And I sent it around and uh, it was published, you know, and um, yeah. uh yeah, I'm happy with it. It's funny because your opinions can change through the years too. I find, you know, what I wrote about then, I might not necessarily think now, but that's just what I had thought at that time, you know. And uh, I think it's good for people to kind of refresh their opinions, not get stuck in some kind of a dogma about, you know, what how they experience at that time it doesn't have to be the way you experience it ten years later. That's the thing about films and music or any kind of art. So, um, yeah, so it was really kind of just a selfish thing on my part. Selfish. What I really enjoyed about um, your book as well is how you you sort of you charted the progression, and and very much as I do on, when I'm writing um, the Laurel and Hardy blog, I'm I'm trying to 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 cover each film in chronological order, yeah. as Randy covers it in his books in in that order that they were filmed. Because as you just said, you know you can chart that development. Um, and so can you, um, could you just as a little sort of contextual recap for, for the listeners, could you give us your sort of thoughts on the key moments of the boys development, uh, leading up to the finishing touch? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, they were together and, and, uh, they're just, for me, um, they, uh, were, to, you know, their personalities were coming together as sort of, uh, from, you know, putting pants on Philip where Stan was like this, uh, kind of an alien being coming from another place. And it's like, then he's meeting up with the state and conventional Oliver Hardy. And, uh, you know, in some ways that sort of thing, the idea that, you know, Stan is some weirdo from some other place. And then Ollie, you know, <laughs> thinks himself to be, um, this, this, uh, sort of a, um, archetype of, uh, you know, this, uh, guy who knows what's going on, the normal guy. And, uh, and, uh, in each film after that, um, yeah, it's kind of revealed in that Ollie is, is just as uh, alien and as dumb as Stan, if not more so. And uh, uh, I think they had in a couple of films leading up to this, if I'm not mistaken, sorry if I am, um, they um, were doing this reciprocal destruction routine that that uh, worked really well for them. If you go back and look at the the reviews of Hats Off, you know, the film that's lost now, unfortunately, but that was one of the, I think, first that they did that ended up with the reciprocal destruction, the entire street destroying everybody else's hats. And the uh, reviews of the time were incredible for it. And it got this great big publicity push. And uh, I think in the Stan Laurel himself said he never heard that many laughs and people laughing so hard in a theater in his life, you know, as was for, for Hats Off. So that was a great thing. And they obviously we used it in a lot of the early ones, like a, a small conflagration or a little fight between the, the, the two characters, Stan and Ollie goes outwards towards the entire community and drowns it in a sea of violent anarchism. And that's the end of the film for the end. Then. But uh, I feel that the finishing touch is, is, is really uh, kind of important because it shows them moving away from that. And uh, more so, it seems to me, uh, with the characters as well, like having more between the two characters, them fighting against each other, and also the little subtleties, right? Stan seems to be more uh, going towards the um, incredibly dumb kind of infant, right? When he is uh, in the movie, he does all these sorts of dumb things that all he responds and reacts to, just like the Lauren Hardy that you would later know, like their characters were still forming. But um, the thing of like where he put, you know, at the very beginning of the film, where it's like put a rock under the wheel of the truck to stop it from going down the hill. And Stan goes and puts it in front of the front wheel. And then, you know, all just looks at him and I think kicks him. And then later on, when they're talking about it's hard to understand what all he's trying to convey with these elaborate hand gestures at one time over them. Like, you know, obviously they're making it up off the top of their heads about what they're going to do in building the house. And Stan tries to get a grip on what he's trying to say and then. In a minute, he thinks he's lost one of his fingers because he has it folded under his glove and he starts crying when he's lost it. So it's like all these uh, intimate character things. I think what you were saying about Soup to Nuts being after this one. And, yes. Uh, and then even even in that one, you have Stan acting out of character where he gets all angry and starts directing yes, people around the that's kitchen. right. Or angry, you know, out of character as we see it now. Um, but in... Uh, the finishing touch, yeah, yeah, everything's remarkably in character in the way that um, they remained throughout the rest of their films. And also, 
you know, they move from the reciprocal destruction thing, the wide anarchic uh, nuttiness infecting a whole crowd, to just uh, the two of them trying to do a simple task and then failing repeatedly until the end where they fail like irrevocably and destroy the whole house, you know, but like it's all this. <laughs> and uh, that was the basic formula they would use for the rest of their career, as far as I can see in a lot of their greatest films. It's like the two of them just trying to do one simple task, whether it's delivering a piano up the stairs or cleaning a house or fixing up a boat or whatever. Um, and this kind of is the first one like that. They're assigned a, a, a task to do, finish off building the house for the $500 and it's just, all that follows is just a bunch of gags. And um, to me, uh, there's kind of a purity about the film that's really cool. Uh, the, the two of them, um, they, you know, there's that whole sense of the, the, the terrible inevitability of a lot of their gags. You can see it 500 miles away that, that what's going to happen. And it repeatedly happens, which I guess for some people who aren't fans can be a drag. But like, it's really just like the modus operandi of their whole thing, you know. He goes and he steps in the nails and hurts his, his foot. And then, he, you know, two minutes later, he steps in the same pile of nails. Or Ollie continually wants to go out and, and do something. And he, he fills his mouth with nails in order. And he, re, even though he swallowed a whole mouthful of nails, he's going to do it again. And the same. But uh, I, you know, I think there's a lot to like about the film. And I don't, yeah, necessarily. Um, agree with it just being dis uh, dismissed uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the construction of the film is great. I mean, you have them building the house and then you have Edgar Kennedy as the cop and then um, Dorothy Coburn as that nurse and that those two characters who come in every so often and, uh, and she's great um, and really funny. And uh, so is he. And then, um, yeah, there's just lots of moments in the film. Like I think some of Stan's, uh, best pantomime little things coming in, into the film. Like when he, it always cracks me up when the, the owner's taking them around the side of the house to explain what he wants done and stands walking along as if, you know, he knows what he's doing and he <laughs> slips and falls on the ground, you know, yeah. and, and just the way he, it's like, it's it, just the way it's done. It's done with a lot of skill, right? Because you know that uh, uh, he's not expecting it. And then, Another part where Stan does that little ballet with uh, trying to put a window frame in. Oh, that is and so good. In, yeah. in, in like two seconds, like the whole thing's falling apart and he's falling on the ground. And uh, and just uh, I, lo I love a lot of those just when the, uh, the cop come over to speak to them about making the noise. And they're already in the midst of a fight between themselves. And they run around the house two or three times <laughs> while the cops stand there looking at them. And it goes to the essence of the thing. Like these two work guys, work, you know, working guys supposed to be working on a house and they're acting like children you know running around and um so yeah like uh i did go back to my book to read what i said because i couldn't necessarily remember but yeah where i kind of said well yeah the, oh, the, this thing initiated this film initiated a lot of stuff they would use for the rest of their careers you know i think it's true it's you know it's just one of those films that anybody from any civilization could watch you, you had no subtitles and know exactly what was going on all the way through it it's kind of like very pure so yeah yeah no, I think you're right, and I mean, we, you know, we were just saying before we before we started recording that. I mean, I, I absolutely love the film. It's what it is one of my, if not the favorite of my uh, of the silent films for me. It might be for me, yeah. And, and but I, and I find it quite um, not strange, but you know, Randy Scrapvet's brilliant book on the boys is fairly dismissive in in the few comments that he makes. Mm. Um, and and also William K. Everson was also you know quite dismissive of it, um, and I just wonder whether it's it may be to do with the fact that there's there's not a lot of um, emphasis on the relationship aspect of the boys. It's very much them two just causing mayhem. There's no kind of um, you know looking after each other or it's it's just chaos. It's a chaotic film. Uh, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of the people like they like the relationship aspect. They like that sort of brotherly bond between the two. Um, so I wonder if that may be uh, a little bit t to blame for that. And also Stan Laurel himself wasn't very fond of the film. That's right. That's um, right too. You know, so uh, which, which <laughs> it just amazes me. And I guess that in a way, as you were, you were saying, Kip, that leading up to that, you have this sort of the, the mass destruction scenes. It, it all leads up to that final, that finale, which yeah. went down so well. Battle of the Century was exactly the same. Um, yeah. And then Finishing Touch, it just kind of, 
it just sort of peters out. It, it doesn't have a big finale, and, and I'm happy with that. That's there's no there's not no no problem for me. Um, mm. And so and you know the next film that comes along from Soup to Nuts, you know there's no grand finale. I don't think really of that scale. But then you're mm. Don they sort of go back to that again with the shin kicking, trouser ripping. Everybody's involved. Um, yeah, really, you can just see they really are just testing what works, what doesn't work. I didn't quite like finishing touch, so let's bring that back in, bring this element. It's mm. it's it's really interesting. Yeah, really really. Interesting interesting to see it um see it unfolding something else you mentioned in, in your book as well uh, which i really like the way you sort of you build it up is the there's the development of the characters in terms of the costume uh, with oh, yeah. the hats um and and the suits uh, what, what what i just love about this film and, and also you know the music box and busy bodies is they're wearing their overalls and they're wearing bowler hats at the same yeah. time. I mean, who wears, who wears that kind of an outfit? Exactly, you? yeah. You're building a house, but you've got to have a bowler hat. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had to keep them on, yes. Yeah. So which, uh, I want to just take us a little step back. Which of your, uh, which of the of the boys' pre-team films um, is your favourite, would you say, Kip, just, you know, leading up to this? Yeah, it's funny because I've never really gotten into them they've never had that appeal to me like i find them interesting as historical artifacts maybe you know um uh i know i have the stan laurel short comedies a, a one collection of them here and uh in some ways uh one of the better ones was um dr pickle and mr pride one of the oh, yeah. movie you know but like the appeal of it is is nothing like with laurel and hardy you know yes. and uh it's in some ways i just feel about the the Stan Laurel and the early Oliver Hardy comedies, the same way I do about the Fox comedies, although it's a different thing, you know, when they later, you know, like I don't really have that much interest in, in watching them. They, you know, um, uh, and uh, of course, you know, in the, in the later Fox and NGM films, they weren't allowed to do what they wanted to do. And I guess in the films before their teaming, especially with the Stan films, it seems he didn't really know what he wanted to do. You know, it was just sort of the actually, because I did actually watch last night Smitty, which is a Stan Laurel solo film that people have said was an inspiration for, for the finishing touch. Yes. But uh, as far as I can see, it only shares one gag and uh, with the finishing touch, it has Stan uh, with Finlayson and sort of Finlayson is almost doing an Ollie role because he's continually um, being uh, damaged or destroyed by the unwitting stupidity of Stan through the movie and the things that he does. And that's interesting in its own way. The one gag that the films do film, the two films do share is uh, when uh, Stan is cutting the board. And uh, in the earlier film, Finlayson is on the other side of the board. In the in the film, uh, the finishing touch, uh, of course, Ollie is on the other side of the board. And um, but with the early Stan Laurel film, it's just shown as him doing a stupid thing, cutting, sawing the board, and then the other guy falls off, and that's it. But in the finishing touch you see more of the emerging Laurel and Hardy style, right? Which is a stand sawing at the board. The audience knows what's going to happen. They can see Ollie standing on the other end of the board uh, doing the roofing or whatever he's doing. And it just goes on for like a minute or something. He <laughs> stands sawing it. Then he has to take a break because he's tired. And then he gets his hat mixed up with the saw. And it's just drawn out ridiculously until finally he does it. And then you get the payoff of Ollie falling, you know? So it shows... The, the style, it was made a hundred times funnier than, rather than just the old gag of somebody sawing something off and another person falling. So I would say that that, that uh, shows the injection of their personalities and then sort of their, their, their emerging style coming out, you know. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I, um, do you have a favorite of the solo films? Um, solo films? I don't think I have a favorite as such of the solo films. Um I mean, I, I pay a little bit more attention to the the sort of the pre team films um, where the you know the boys are both in them. Oh, they may I not see. Necessarily Is that what you meant Hardy. by the question? Yeah, well, yeah, any either really. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, okay. I've, yeah, I, I go through phases with the solo films. I must admit, um, and mm -hmm. obviously, I mean, a, a, a barrier to enjoying those films is uh, if you've got a decent copy to watch for, to start <laughs> with. But uh, yeah. with this, with the recent Blu-ray release, um, it's a lot easier to, to get more out of those films now. Um, but uh, in terms of the sort of the pre-teen films prior to Second Hundred Years, say, um, I think probably. 
I always said the drifter was Sailors Beware. There's something about Sailors Beware that I oh, really yeah, enjoy. Yeah. I just I love the Stan character in that. I think I've mentioned this before on a number of episodes, uh-huh. um, and and it's because he has that in, in very much. Um, Still around at this period as well, uh, with um, certainly from Super Tunes, he has that bit of fire still about him. Yeah, um, yes. where he's he's not afraid to let you know if he's you know if he's pissed off. <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, he, he's he's quite happy to have a go. And then, but if he's told off about it, he'll certainly resort to tears, which yeah. is perfect <laughs> stand. You know, so I think I, I always I generally drift towards that one. I think. Um, yeah. Apart from, I mean, Do Detectives Think is obviously very closely Laurel and Hardy, so that's quite an obvious one. But I think aside from that, yeah, I I drift towards Sailors Beware. Isn't that a daisy? It's all right with me. I think we've probably touched on this a a little bit already as well. Just uh, can you explain what you think makes Laurel and Hardy so special and, and why do you think they're so loved even today? Why do you think they've endured? Well, I think because of that nature of the relationship between the two of them, you know, and, um, uh, you know, they are kind of uh, iconic looking as well. Just the simple appearance. I'm not, you know, I hope that they'll continue, <laughs> you know, to be loved. Uh, I'm, you know, I know that they still are among certain quarters today. You know, maybe it'd be, I, I think, you know, maybe younger generations don't really know of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that the, the films, the way they're constructed, you know, that was the films are based totally around their rhythm, like between the two of them. Um, the fact that they were able to do as they wanted, like at well, shoot everything in sequence and things like that, makes the films um, kind of a world onto themselves, which I think once people through the generations get into, can really appreciate, you know, and um, just uh, and they are simply funny, you know. Um, and they, you know, remain so. There's nothing that's dated or um, they kind of create their, their own world. So you can sink into it more so than maybe a person could in other like old black and white films that look so archaic now. But they kind of create a world onto themselves, which is even beyond that, you know. So it's not just nostalgia or looking at old stuff. It's, uh, it's just being immersed in uh, this world, which is... It's not just them either. It's the kind of the characters that are all around them are are part of this world too, you know, Um, and all their great supporting actors playing those characters too. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think also, you know, that that relationship element that we just talked about a little bit, you know, that is such a... um, I want to say unique elements to to these kind of films. You know, you look at the sort of the side, you know, the, the the big silent clowns, Keaton, Chaplin, and Lloyd, and they were fabulous. And and but they were always just, you know, they they were kind of on their own. Whereas these yeah. two together have something that we all kind of share. Uh, that there's love for each other, and this um, it's just a, it's just a beautiful thing to watch and to see it develop. And I don't know, there's there's just something very very special about Stan and Babe that. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think there'll always be a place for them. I think as as long as we uh, try to keep on spreading the word, um, oh yeah, pe- people will find them. And as you say, you know, all walks of life, all all nations can enjoy the finishing touch um, because it is such a visual comedy, as as all their comedies are. Um, mm-hmm. And so, hopefully, fingers crossed that that will that will help to you know continue into the future for them. So, brilliant. <sighs> yeah, I think it's also everybody can relate to the idea of like reacting to somebody else's stupidity and like yeah. the frustrations of life and the, you know, looking into the invisible camera to register your disgust, you know, but at the same time, you yourself do something equally as stupid in the next moment, you know? So that's <laughs> the shared bond of humanity is that, you know, we're all continually doing stupid things. And uh, the fact that, you know, it's almost like within the context of, of watching a 20 minute long hearty film, you can kind of admit that about yourself, you know, before you go back into the world and, say that you're perfect and never do anything stupid but the um sailors beware film that you were speaking that's the one where they're on the ship and then yeah. stan is like a porter and then sort of a guy and then there's a, right. a, a little person too and then yes. yeah and then <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a fast paced moving good comedy i remember that one now yeah yes yeah yeah and he's got that he's got the baby or the, the so-called baby uh, yes. in the in that pram and he just yeah. pushes it down that flight of stairs that's right yeah <laughs> lots of uh Right it's really good yeah really good um uh, one thing i was going to think about the film um also yeah. it's like the 
like I, it's really, they really, really hit it hard in this film is like the undying stupidity of them, right? You get continually through the film, which is another big Laurel and Hardy thing maybe is lost in the reciprocal destruction films, but that becomes, you know, at, to the forefront. And uh, the one, the, the, the one gag that keeps going over that's, you know, it's really funny, but I, I've never seen this explained. They have the ramp that goes up to a workhorse, <laughs> right? And then for some reason to get over to the porch, they have a board leading from the workhorse over to the porch. And there's no reason for that board to be there. They could have just put the ramp up to the porch. Could they not have? <laughs> right? And so, like, they have this this thing where it's repeatedly going, you, oh, you know, they're carrying the thing over and going past the workhorse on the little bridge that they make, and it smashes, it, it breaks under all his weight, and he falls. And they do this two or three times, but they never question the fact that like, there's no particular reason for that bridge to be there. <laughs> like, they could have easily have moved the ramp over, and it, they just do that gag over and over. It's almost like the... the the level of stupidity that's like later in the music box where they take the thing to the top of the stairs and the guys, yes. or you could have taken it around this road. So they carry it all the way down to the stairs in order to do it the right way. Um, <laughs> like new, new uh, frontiers of stupidity, you know? Um, yes. Yeah. Which yeah. I think that's another. <laughs> but then where's the fun in just stepping up straight onto the, uh, onto the, onto right. the veranda. Exactly. <laughs> there's no fun in that. There's, you have to complicate it. Yeah. Yeah. But I know you just you, you picked up on that point as well uh, a few minutes ago about uh, Stan putting that window in. Uh, yeah. And the frame that that, that is ju- I can I can watch that just that little scene over and over. Yeah. It, it's absolute perfection. How how he pulls that off and the thing just crumbles at just the right moment. I mean I, d- I don't know whether it was yeah. set up so somebody was pulling at wires, but the way that he collapses with the whole thing is just Perf- just perfect. Probably one of the yeah. best moments I think in any 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 of the boys' films or any comedy film is just sublime yeah. how he does that. Really, really good. Amazing, yeah. Fantastic. Um, great stuff. Okay, um, what I'd like to just move on to um, as we come to the end of the questions on finishing touch, Kip. I wanted to ask you the atoll question. Um, hopefully, you've you've had a little look at the atoll question, but you are mm-hmm. about to be stranded on a deserted atoll. Um, but you're being allowed to take okay. with you four Laurel and Hardy related items, um, a silent short, a talkie short, a feature film and a Laurel and Hardy related book. Unfortunately, not your own. Um, so uh, let us know what I are your choices. I refuse to play then. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your choices and can you explain why, um, including any favorite scenes? Well, uh, yeah. Um, with the silent short, um, this one might be near the top, you know, I, I don't know. I just, uh, watching the film again, last night, preparation for this, my estimation went up even higher. I yeah. also enjoy Liberty of their yeah. silent films. Um, when I did a showing of their films a little while ago, I did two Tars, big business and Liberty. I was really going in deep for the two reciprocal destruction films, but now I kind of wish I would have put finishing touch in there. Um, but, um, which bit about Liberty do you like best, Kip? Just as interest, do you, do you like the first half or the second half? Uh, it's hard. Well, um, I like them both, you know, because they're both like the, the first half goes into like a, a lot of subtle, like pantomime and kind of suggestive humor as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's just a really well-made comedy, I think, just like this one. You know, um, they do that. They, they go through, exhaust all their gags with the crab in their pants on the ground. And then they go and up high, which is... Uh, on the skyscraper, which is not something that they usually did. It's kind of like a borrowing a page from Harold Lloyd or something, but then the way they do it is so excellent too. The effect is so great of how they filmed it using the, a mock-up of a building on top of another building. So you get that real sense of uh, peril, but they're up there and um, uh, it's, you know, the, 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 un, unlike a, a Chaplin or a Keaton or even a Harold Lloyd that showed their resourcefulness in such a thing. They're like most people would be in such a situation, paralyzed with fright, you know, and trying to inch out there. And it's just, you know, a lot of really good acrobatic acting uh, uh, up there on those heights, you know? And um, so, yeah, I might choose the, the finishing touch or I might choose Liberty, you know? Uh, and then the humor of it. Uh, one reason I can see why Stan Laurel also chose putting pants on Philip as, as the first Lone Hardy film. I mean, people debated or whatever. Right. But it's just a really well-made comedy too. It's just really well-crafted. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Maybe I'm not as 
these days as big a fan of, of, of the big reciprocal destruction routines, you know, I mean, you don't see their personality necessarily in those very much, right? It becomes a thing. Um, for the sound films, um, the sound shorts, um, you know, uh, it's funny because what I was saying about your opinions change over time, right? And for a while, I got so tired of hearing about the music box being lauded as such, being such a masterpiece and all that. And as a kid, I would kind of avoid it more so, but then I'd come back to it. And I think it's actually so really great, you know, like sometimes the hyped things deserve the hype, you know. Maybe for a sound short, I would choose the music box with uh, a little bit of an edge to them to our heels because it's such a relaxed film <laughs> of like their characters and, uh, you know, um, and the long scene of them preparing their meal at the, yeah. you know, is so great too. So, yeah, I'm giving you two of them for each thing. But... I'm, I'm going to have to pin you down in a minute. I'll let you mull it over. You can, you can talk okay. around it, but I'm, I'm going to pin you down in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might do the finishing touch, the music box, uh, you know, and for the features. Um, yeah, I go between the blockheads um, and Way Out West. Um, yeah. Uh, I, uh, the, you know, for a while there, yeah, blockheads just because it's so like ridiculous and it's like such a film about nothing, nothing but <laughs> guys. It's all the film is about as far as I can see. And yeah. uh, it almost has a modern sensibility in that way. That was a good idea of yours. Come, 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 come. Don't block the stairway there. Come on. What's right? Who do you think you're talking to? I'm talking to you, you big overstuffed polywog. You smile when you call me that. Ha! If we went in this respectable apartment house, I'd wipe the floor up with you. Oh, don't let that stop you. Why don't you take him outside? Outside? See, he's afraid to go. Who's afraid to go? Anytime you're ready. <laughs> well, there's no time like the present. I should come on. Say well, come you on. Can't you can't get away with that with me. Don't you want to apologize? It's all right with me. Apologize? Yes. Ah, for what? For calling me an overstuffed polywog. No man living can call me an overstuffed polywog and get away with it. All right, all right. You're not an overstuffed polywog. Well, that's better. You're an inflated blimp. Um, and then, but yeah, I... I watched where west you know it's got so much soul and it's so well crafted yeah. as a film too yeah. it's almost like a great film aside from Laurel and hardy being in it you know it's like yeah you know, it says so um i have to put a tie in for that one for sure but yeah oh a tie okay. i'll let you, I'll not, let you I, might, I might let you have two i might let you have two features don't okay. tell anybody else <laughs> no i won't i mean um, yeah very good. And, uh, and okay, so for your Laurel and Hardy-related book, what would you take with you? Well, you probably uh, would want to use the Randy Scredvet book because it's got everything in it, that latest one that he put out, and also you can also use it as a raft to escape from that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That might sink. It's, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> well, it's so large, though. It has buoyancy. And I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think I could, I could work something out with the skipper and the professor where it would – you know, turbocharge out of there to Culver City or something. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it's just got so much in it. You know, you could, you almost don't uh, yeah. need any other book. You know, I, I kind of, I have a um, uh, was uh, affection for that other one that with the McCabe, Kilgore, and Band put together. That, oh yeah, that, that that was the one before with all the pictures in it because I remember that coming out when I was a kid and it's like 
what, what is this? Oh, that's great. I have to save up my money and buy that, you know, when I saw in the bookstore, you know, um, treasure trove. But, um, yeah. Um, good choices. Good, so good, very good choices. Uh, I mean, okay, so we'll, we'll let you take Randy Skretvet's book with you. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that it, it is it is an obvious choice because it is such a fabulous book. Um, what sort of books, other than Randy's, um, n- n- not so much the visual kind of ones, what, what sort of books would you recommend to people who want to read up more about Laurel and Hardy? Well, the first one, the John McKay, Mr. Lone, Mr. Hardy is, is really great. I think still, you know, like a, uh, uh, it's a nice, like, a, you know, a rundown of their careers and appreciation of them. And, uh, um, yeah, I think that's a, uh, it remains, uh, a really great book. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that have been out. I mean, um, there's Simon Louvish had that one, but I, I'm not a big fan of his style necessarily, you know? Um, and, uh, um, and of course, you know, there's errors in the first, the Mr. Or Mr. Hardy one because of the time it was written in, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It was very <laughs> groundbreaking. There wasn't it? And it, as you say, it was the, the, the first book at, uh, everything else sort of followed, followed from it's, uh, you know, it is, it's a lovely book. I like this. Yeah. I do. I do like the Simon Lovish book. Um, okay. it's, I, I could understand what you're saying about the style. Um, and mm-hmm. I think the, the chronology is a little bit all over the place as well for me, which it, it just sort of jars with a, a little bit for me, but, uh, a very enjoyable read. It's 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 a, 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 one that I would recommend. Uh, personally. Yeah, maybe I'll come back to. It. I do have a copy of it. I'll maybe I'll come back to it. Um, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Though. Over time. Yeah. yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, you have some good choices there. You have some very good choices. Um, you've snuck two feature films in, which is very naughty, but I'll let you do it. Thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, do you have any um, any sort of other projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to just promote whilst you have our ears? Well, I just I keep writing the fiction, and there might be something coming over in the next couple of years. And um, my music is going along, and uh, uh, I put out a record in this past December. And um, I'm always working on something, you know. Uh, I can't think. <laughs> I'm getting through this time of COVID and not playing live and things yeah. like that. You know, it's, a, it's a different uh, adjustment and things. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I'll be back for sure with something. That's good. And where can people find you, Kip? Are you online anywhere? Have you got a website? Or yeah, I'm kipharness.net, and uh, uh, that's the website for yeah all my writing and the songs too, and the uh, and um, sure. And I have a group on about my music on Facebook, the music of Kip Harness, and um, I think that's all. I Brilliant. Can well, I'll, I'll make sure there's uh, I'll make sure there's a link to to your Laurel and Hardy book in the the show notes as well, so people can find that and hopefully get pick themselves up a copy. I would truly recommend it. It's a it's a really interesting read. Great analysis, okay. Kip. Thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been uh, it's been wonderful. And um, yeah, stay safe. Good luck with yeah, the with the music and get back on that stage. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. I will and. Uh... I'll, I'll keep listening to your podcast as well. See, you do that. Brilliant. Yeah. That's, that's one listener then. That's good. You'll be going through all the films. <laughs> that's the plan. That is the plan. You're it's going to take me, it's going to take me a long time. Yeah. It's going to yeah. take me a long time. Well, the good thing uh, is you see the, the Fox films are way off in the distance, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope yeah. they stay there. <laughs> Terminal depression. Through the- <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of hoping that by the time I get to the Fox films, I think actually that wasn't as bad as I thought, you know, yeah. I've seen it for a long time now. So um, yeah, we will see. We will see. But uh, th- thank you so much. Sir. It's been great. And uh, you take thank care. You, Patrick. you too. Take care. Thank you Jeez. very much. Thanks. And that's all for episode 15. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I did putting it together. Uh, Your homework for next time is to watch the next film in the boys' chronology, which is the delightful From Soup to Nuts. And that way you'll be better equipped when we meet again for episode 16, where I'm thrilled to say we'll be welcoming back Randy Skretvet, who'll be sharing his thoughts on the film and also on a very special lady, Anita Garvin. Now make sure you don't miss that or any new episode by subscribing to the blogcast through your podcast provider. Uh, And you can keep in touch with us and join in or even start discussions about these wonderful films by joining us in the Blogheads Facebook group. And that way you can also stay up to date with all the latest blogs, news and merchandise from the Laurel and Hardy blog and the Blogheads community. So all that remains is to say thank you to our special guests, Randy Skretvet and Kip Harness for joining us today. 
Don't forget you can find affiliate links to purchase Randy and Kip's books in the show notes and on the Laurel and Hardy blog website. Huge thanks as usual to Basta Music and the Bohunks Orchestra. And most of all, thanks to you for being with me again. And until next time, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. (laughs) And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye.